Chapter 11 of the Book of This and That. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind. On Christmas. There is a cant of Christmas, and there is a cant of anti Christmas. There are some people who want to throw their arms round you simply because it is Christmas. There are other people who want to strangle you simply because it is Christmas. Thus, between those who appreciate and those who depreciate Christmas, it is difficult for an ordinary man to escape bruises. As I grow older, I confess I accept Christmas more philosophically than I used to do. There was a time when it seemed a dangerous institution, like home life or going to church. One felt that in undermining its joys, one was making a breach in the defenses of an ancient hypocrisy. Still more, one resented the steady boredom of the day, the boredom of a day from which one had been led to expect larger ecstasies than a surfeit of dishes and the explosion of crackers can give. One might have enjoyed it well enough, perhaps, if one had not had the feeling that it was one's duty to be happy. But to be deliberately happy for a whole day was a task as exhausting as deliberately hopping with one's feet tied. It was not that one wanted to be unhappy. It was merely that one desired one's liberty to be either as happy or as miserable as one pleased. Remembering these early hostilities, I would not bid anyone be happy or merry or jolly on Christmas Day, except as the turkey and plum pudding move them. At the same time, I cannot let the festival pass without recanting my childish insolence towards the holly and the mistletoe. I have been converted to Christmas as thoroughly almost as that Prince of Individuals, Scrooge. I can now pull a cracker with any man. I can accept gifts without actual discourtesy. And if the flame goes out before the plum pudding reaches me, I am as mortified as can be. The Christmas tree shines with the host of the stars, and I can even forgive my neighbor who plays while shepherds watched all day long on the gramophone. The Salvation Army, which plays the same tune and one or two others all through the small hours on the trombone and the coronet a piston, is a severer test of endurance. But even that one can grin and bear when one remembers that the Salvationist bandsmen are but a sort of melancholy herald angels. The solitary figure in the Christmas procession, indeed, whom one hates with a boiling and bubbling hatred, is the postman who does not call. In Utopia, the postman does not miss a letter box on Christmas Day, or any other day. It would be affectation to pretend, however, that one has suddenly developed a craving for plum pudding and cracker mottos in one's middle age. One's reconcilement with Christmas is due neither to one's stomach nor to a taste for the wit and wisdom of cracker manufacturers. It is simply that one has come to enjoy a season of lordly inutility, when for the space of a day or two the cash nexus hangs upon the world as light as air. It is no small thing to have this upsetting of the tyrannies, if it is only for a few hours. The heathen, as we call them, realized this even before the birth of Christ, and had the Saturnalia and other festivals of the kind in which a communism of license ruled, if not a communism of gentleness. It is still an instinct in many Christian places to turn Christmas into a general orgy, to make it a day on which one bows down and worships the human maw, and there are worse things in the world than brandy sauce. On the other hand, there is also the instinct to make of the day a door into a new world of neighborliness. It is the only day in the year on which many men speak humanly to their servants and open their eyes to the cheerful lives of children and simple people. Hypercritical youth will deny that man has a right to confine his neighborliness to a single day in the year any more than he has a right to confine his sanctity to the Sabbath. But we who have ceased to exact miracles from human nature are glad to have even a single day as a beginning. Socialism, we may admit, depends upon the extension of the Christmas festival into the rest of the year. 
it demands that the relations between man and man shall be as far as possible not shopkeeping relations but christmas relations in other words it aims at a society in which the little conquests of gain will cease to be the chief end of time and men will no more think of cheating each other than romeo would think of cheating juliet nor is there any other side of the new civilization which will be more difficult to build than this this is the very spirit of the new city without it the rest would be but a chaos of stones and mortar a gehenna of purposeless machinery it is an extraordinary fact that the rediscovery of christmas in the nineteenth century was not followed sooner by the rediscovery of the limitations of individualism dickens himself the incarnation of christmas did not realize till quite late in life what a denial modern civilization is of the christmas spirit even in hard times where as mr shaw pointed out he expresses the insurrection of the human conscience against a manchesterized society he offers us no hope except from the spread of a sort of tory benevolence perhaps however it does not matter how you label benevolence so long as it is the real thing and is not merely another name for that most insidious form of egotism patronage that dickens was pugnaciously benevolent in all his work except when he was writing about dissenters and americans was one of the most fortunate accidents in the popular literature of the nineteenth century he did not perhaps dramatize the secret mystery of human brotherhood the brotherhood of saint and fool and criminal and ordinary man as tolstoy and dostoevsky had done in some of their work but he dramatized goodwill with a thoroughness never attempted before in england on the whole it may be doubted whether the christmas spirit has not grown stronger and deeper since the time of dickens only a few years ago it seemed as though it were dying people began to detest even christmas cards as something more victorian than the idols of the king but here the old enthusiasm is back again and we can no more kill christmas than the lion could kill androcles perhaps the popularization of italian art as well as dickens has something to do with it our imaginations cannot escape from the virgin and the child and we are like children ourselves in the inquisitiveness with which we peer into that magic stable where the ass and the cow worship and the shepherds and the kings and the little angels in their nightgowns are on their knees there has come back a gaiety a playfulness into the picture such as our grandfathers might have thought irreverent but their grandfathers grandfathers on the other hand would have seen to be perfectly natural the cult of the child has perhaps been overdone in recent years and we have brought our mawkishness and our morbid analysis even to the side of the cradle at the same time no one has yet been able to point out a way by which we can escape from the obsession of rates and taxes of profit and loss except by the recovery of a child's vision without that vision religion itself becomes a matter of profit and loss with that vision the dullest world blossoms with flowers even truisms cease to be meaningless and christmas is itself again out of the drowning of the world we have made a toy for the nursery and the birth of the king of glory has become the theme of a song for infants one of the most exquisite pictures in literature is that of the three ships that come sailing into bethlehem on christmas day in the morning and not less childishly beautiful is that other carol there comes a ship far sailing then st michael was the steersman st john sat in the horn our lord harped our lady sang and all the bells of heaven they rang on christ's sunday at morn one sees the same childish imagination at work in the old english carol hail comely and clean in which the three shepherds come to the inn and stable with their gifts the first with a bob of cherries for the newborn baby the second with a bird and the third with a tennis ball hail cries the third shepherd hail darling dear full of god heed i pray thee be near when that i have need hail sweet thy cheer my heart would bleed to see thee sit here in so poor weed with no pennies hail put forth thy doll i bring thee but a ball have and play thee with all and go to the tennis 
these songs it may be are more popular to-day than they were fifty years ago partly owing to the decline of the old-fashioned suspicious sort of protestantism which saw the pope behind every bush including the holly bush one remembers how protestants of the old school used to denounce even raphael's grave madonnas as trash of popery i'll have no popish pictures in my house declared a man i know to his son who had brought home the sistine madonna to hang on his walls and the picture had to be given away to a friend similarly the observance of christmas day was regarded in some places as a popish superstition one old protestant clergyman many years ago used to make the rounds of his friends and parishioners on christmas morning to wish them the compliments of the day it was his custom however to pray with each of them and in the course of his prayers to explain that he must not be regarded as taking christmas day seriously lord he would pray we are not gathered here in any superstitious spirit as the roman catholics are under the delusion that thy son was born in bethlehem on the twenty-fifth of december hast not thou told us in thy holy book that on the night on which thy son was born the shepherd watched their flocks by night in the open air and thou knowest o lord that in the fierce and inclement weather of december with its biting frosts and its whirling snows this would not have been possible and can be but a popish invention but having set himself right with god he was human enough to proceed on his journey of good wishes noble intolerance like his is now i believe dead to-day even a plymouth brother may wreathe his bow with mistletoe and a presbyterian may wish you a merry christmas without the sky or the shorter catechism falling end of section eleven chapter twelve of the book of this and that this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the book of this and that by robert lind chapter twelve on demagogues it is still the custom in civilized countries for the politicians to call each other names the word serpent has, one regrets to say, fallen out of use. But we are compensated for this in some measure by the invention of new terms of insult almost every day. It is not very long since Mr. Lloyd George called Mr. Steel Maitland the cat's meat man of the Tory party. And Mr. Steel Maitland retorted by calling Mr. Lloyd George Gehazi the leper. And side by side with original fancies of this kind, the old-fashioned dictionary of abuse still stands as open as the English Bible, where statesmen may arm themselves with nouns and adjectives that everybody can understand, such as Duke, Turncoat, Jack Cade, Paid Agitator, Irish, Attorney, Despot, Nefarious, which was almost as dead as Serpent till Sir Edward Carson revived it, and last but not least, demagogue. It is only a day or two since Mr. Bonner Law called Mr. Lloyd George a demagogue, and one was disappointed to find that Mr. Lloyd George, instead of calling Mr. Bonner Law Nebuchadnezzar or Judas Iscariot in return, merely insisted that he could not be a demagogue, because a demagogue was a man who kicked away the ladder by which he had risen. This is very much as if you were to call a man Bill Sykes, and he retorted that he could not be Bill Sykes because Bill Sykes had a wooden leg. Of course Bill Sykes had not a wooden leg, and a demagogue is not necessarily a man who kicks away the ladder by which he has risen. A demagogue is simply a mob leader, a man who appeals to popular passions rather than principles. He is what half the statesmen of all parties aspire to be in every democratic community. Despots obtain their mastery over the crowd by the sword, demagogues by the catchword. That is the difference between a tyranny and a democracy. It may not seem to be a change for the better to those who have a taste for the costumes and lights of the theatre, but the demagogue at least consults the mob as though it had a mind and will of its own. 
the very way in which he flatters it and instigates it to passion is an assertion of its freedom of choice and therefore a concession to the dignity of human nature it is like wooing as compared with marriage by capture even when we have put the demagogue securely above the despot however we are left in considerable doubt about him somehow or other we do not like him we do not trust him further than we can see him we distrust him as aristophanes shakespeare and dickens did we feel that the difference between a demagogue and a statesman is that the former converts human beings into a mob while the latter exalts a mob into a company of human beings it is the difference between a pander and a prophet it is true that men of a conservative temper hate the pander and the prophet almost equally shakespeare for instance who is a bad politician as well as a good poet mocks at utopias no less than at bombast in that unhistorical picture he suggests of jack cade cade there shall be in england seven halfpenny loaves sold for a penny the three hooped pot shall have ten hoops and i will make it felony to drink small beer all the realm shall be in common and in cheapside shall my palfrey go to grass and when i am king as king i will be all god save your majesty cade i thank you good people there shall be no money all shall eat and drink on my score and i will apparel them all in one livery that they may agree like brothers and worship me their lord dick the first thing we do let's kill all the lawyers cade nay that i mean to do to many of us if you omit cade's occasional lapses into individualism as in his desire to be worshipped as a king this will seem an admirable program it will more than hold its own in comparison with any program that ever originated in newcastle or birmingham william morris himself might have had that vision of restoring cheapside to green fields and even the extremist marconoclast could hardly go further than cade in suggestions for a summary way with lawyers who is there who is not wholeheartedly with Cade for the abolition of poverty? In fact, there seems little to criticize in the man as Shakespeare drew him, except that he makes proposals for personal, not social, ends. That, I believe, is the real essence of demagogy. To be a demagogue is not to advocate one thing rather than another. It depends on the manner, not on the matter, of one's proposals one may reap one's own glory out of praise of the new jerusalem no less than out of the most vulgar incitements to war and hatred it is a temptation to which every man is subject who has ever stood on a cart above a crowd of his fellows one feels tempted to play on them like a child who finds itself left alone with a piano it is worse than that a crowd is like a sea of liquor the fumes of which go to an orator's head and make him boast and lie and leer as he would be ashamed to see himself doing in his sober senses he becomes to parody novalis on spinoza a mob intoxicated man but there is one notable difference between a decent drunkard and a demagogue the drunkard is satisfied with getting drunk himself the demagogue is not content till he has made the crowd drunk too he and the mob are as it were mutual intoxicants and in the result many a public meeting turns into so disgraceful an orgy that if anything comparable to it occurred in a music hall the license would be withdrawn this is a kind of vice of which the moralists have not yet taken sufficient note and yet there is no more execrable passion on earth than demagogue passion on the one hand and mob passion on the other cleon will always be remembered as one of the basest athenians who ever lived and this is because he was the first demagogue of imperialism a violent animal on his hind legs who bellowed till he woke up the blood-lust of his fellow-citizens he was powerful only so long as he could keep that 
and other popular lusts active. Men, it has been said by a notable philosopher, seek after power rather than beauty. But this, I believe, is only true of demagogues and egoists of kindred sorts. The demagogue is the man who, instead of aiming at bringing the mob to his mood, feels after the mood of the mob, and, having discovered it, whips it into froth and fury. If you keep your eyes open at a public meeting, not always an easy thing to do in days when men discuss Welsh disestablishment, you will see how the demagogue often becomes the master of a meeting that has listened coldly to intelligent and honest speeches. Like pot-boiling an art, it is perfectly easy if you know the way. The sausage-seller, who aspired to be Cleon's rival in the Knights of Aristophanes, expounds the whole art of demagoguery in his prayer. Ye influential, impudential powers of sauciness and jabber, slang and jaw, ye spirits of the marketplace and street, where I was reared and bred, befriend me now, grant me a voluble utterance, and a vast unbounded voice, and steadfast impudence. And in another passage, Demosthenes initiates him into the means of obtaining power over the people. Interlard your rhetoric with lumps of mawkish sweet and greasy flattery. Be fulsome, coarse, and bloody. This, indeed, is what oratory is bound to degenerate into in a democracy, unless it is the weapon of a conviction. It is like any other form of art which is practiced, not from any burning and generous motive, but from mere love of that sense of power which gain and popularity give. Dickens, owing to a curious gap in his knowledge, made his typical trade union leader, Slackbridge, in hard times, a demagogue of the ranting type, who began a speech, Oh, my friends, the downtrodden operatives of Coketown! Oh, my friends and fellow countrymen, the slaves of an iron-handed and grinding despotism! Oh, my friends and fellow sufferers, the fellow workmen and fellow men! Slackbridge, we are also told, was an ill-made, high-shouldered man with lowering brows, and his features crushed into an habitually sour expression. That represents the attitude of many people to popular leaders. They believe that no one can advocate a reasonable future for the poor without being venomous and of an ugly appearance. They do not realize that the demagogues and agitators of today are chiefly men of the propertied classes and their allies, like Sir Edward Carson and Mr. F. E. Smith. Sir Edward Carson's speeches in Ulster, indeed, are the most extreme instances of demagogy we have had in recent years. They are all noise and passion, roaring echoes of the mob's soul, rhetoric and not reason, thunderstorms instead of light. They are appeals to the war spirit, the same spirit that Cleon and all the demagogues have sought to awaken. Incidentally, I admit that a class war or a sex war may as readily produce its Carsons as a war of sectarianism. Sir Edward Carson is the awful example to all creeds and classes of how not to do it. End of chapter 12 Read by Tom Daly Chapter 13 of the Book of This and That This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind. On Coincidences. An amazing story of coincidences appears in the Westminster Gazette. During the Boer War, four men met by chance for the first time on the eve of some big action, and the meeting was so agreeable that one of the men who had a bad two-shilling piece in his pocket divided it and gave each of the others a quarter as a memento of the evening immediately afterwards they separated 
and never saw or heard of each other again till a few evenings ago when a dinner was given in honour of somebody or other in birmingham the four men were friends of the guest of the evening and all of them turned up at the dinner where they recognised each other easily we are told because each of them was wearing his quarter florin on his watch chain life is of course a series of coincidences but we never cease to be surprised as each new one happens and nothing can destroy their recurring freshness we may make mathematical calculations showing that there is a chance in a million that such and such a thing will happen but when it happens once in a million times it seems to us as marvellous as a comet we cannot get accustomed to the pattern of nature which repeats itself as daringly as the pattern in a wallpaper our fathers recognized this pattern and saw in it the weird craftsmanship of destiny we who believe in iron law which surely applies a rigid pattern are by a curious want of logic sceptics and we treat each new emergence of the pattern as a strange exception to scientific rule we cannot believe that nature arranged howlings of dogs and disasters in the stars to accompany the death of a caesar or a napoleon everything that we can call dramatic in nature we put down to chance and coincidence superstitious people confront us with instance upon instance of the succession of omen and event but we label these exception number one exception number two and so forth and go cheerfully on our way believers in omens tell us that some time before loud's trial and execution he found his portrait fallen on the floor and predicted disaster and they ask us to admit that this was more than a coincidence especially as there are a hundred similar stories they relate how the stumble of a horse proved as fatal an omen for mungo park as did the fall of a pitcher for loud one day before he departed on his last expedition to africa his horse stumbled and sir walter scott who was with him said i am afraid this is a bad omen omens follow those who look to them replied the explorer and set forth on the expedition from which he never returned luckily we have examples which suggest that park and not scott was right every one knows the story of william the conqueror's fall as he landed on the shores of england and how in order to calm the superstitious alarm of his followers he called on them to observe how he had taken possession of the country with both hands in the very fact of doing so of course he merely substituted one interpretation of an omen for another but if omens are capable in this way of opposite interpretations we are on the direct road to scepticism about their significance and so to a view that most events that appear to have been heralded by omens are simple coincidences one remarkable coincidence of this kind came to my ears the other day a man i know was suddenly dismissed from his post with three months salary in his pocket i happened to be talking about superstitions with him the same afternoon when he said it's all very well but only last week when i was in the country some one was telling fortunes by tea leaves in the house where i was stopping and he turned to me and said old man there's a big surprise in store for you and i see some money in the bottom of the cup i shan't let them know this has happened he added as it might encourage them to be superstitious certainly when such a coincidence happens in our own lives it is difficult to believe that it is not a deliberate act on the part of nature nature we can see does concern herself with the minutest cell or atom of our being why not with these premonitory shadows of our deeds and sufferings many coincidences on the other hand admit of a less fatalistic explanation everybody has noticed how one no sooner meets a new name in a book that one comes on the same name in real life also for the first time i had not read mr forrest reed's novel the bracknells a week when on walking down a london avenue the same name 
the bracknells stared at me from a gate it is not easy however to conceive that destiny deliberately leads one into a suburban avenue to enjoy the humour of one's surprise at so trivial a coincidence it is a more natural conclusion that these names one begins to notice so livelily would still have remained unobserved were it not that they had acquired a new significance for one's eyes owing to something one had read or heard after all one can ride down the strand on the top of a bus for a month without consciously seeing a single name over a shop window but let any of these names become real to us as the result of some accident and it leaps to one's eyes like a scene in a play it is merely that one now selects this particular name for observation and ignores the others it is all due to the artistic craving for patterns i am inclined at times to explain the evidence in favour of the baconian theory of shakespeare as pattern mongering those ciphers those coincidences of phrase and suggestion at such and such a line from the beginning or end of so many of the plays those recurrences of hoggish pictures are enough to shake the balance of any one who cannot himself go forward with a study of the whole evidence but as we proceed with an examination of the coincidences we find that many of them are coincidences only for the credulous it seems a strange coincidence that shakespeare and bacon should so often make use of the same metaphors and words but it seems strange only till we discover that plenty of other pre shakespearean and elizabethan writers made use of them as well much of the baconian theory indeed is built not upon coincidence but upon pseudo coincidence the fact that shakespeare died on the same day of the month or almost on the same day as that on which he was born is really a more interesting coincidence than any that occurs within the field of baconianism much the same may be said of the coincidences discovered by those who have at one time or another counted up the numerical values of the letters in the names of napoleon and gladstone and other leaders of men and found that they were equal to six 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 the fatal number of the antichrist in nearly every case the name has been distorted in its transliteration into greek in such a way as to make the coincidence no coincidence at all on the other hand there are some genuinely interesting coincidences in figures which have been recorded by various writers on credulity and superstition french history since the middle of the eighteenth century can almost be written as a series of figure mongers coincidences it began with louis sixteen who came to the throne in seventeen seventy four by adding the sum of the ciphers in this figure to the figure itself seventeen seventy four plus one plus seven plus seven plus four the arithmetical diviners point out that you get seventeen ninety three the year of the king's death similarly the beginning of the french revolution foretold the end of the revolutionary period with napoleon's fall for if you add up seventeen eighty nine plus one plus seven plus eight plus nine you get eighteen fourteen the year of elba louis philippe's accession date eighteen thirty gives scarcely less remarkable results if you add to it the figures in seventeen seventy three the date of his birth eighteen thirty plus one plus seven plus seven plus three you get eighteen forty eight the date of his fall and flight it is the same if you add to his accession date the figures in eighteen o nine the date of his marriage here again eighteen thirty plus one plus eight plus zero plus nine results in eighteen forty eight and if you turn to his queen you find that the figures in her birth date seventeen eighty two lead up to the same fatal message eighteen thirty plus one plus seven plus eight plus two once more mount to the ominous figure the arithmeticians whose ingenuities are recorded in mr sharper nolson's origins of popular superstitions have unearthed similar significances in the dates of napoleon three 
they add the figure eighteen fifty two the date of his inauguration as emperor to the ciphers of eighteen o eight his birth date eighteen fifty two plus one plus eight plus zero plus eight and arrive at the fatal date eighteen sixty nine when the empire came to an end the empress eugenie was born in eighteen twenty six and married in eighteen fifty three and the ciphers in these dates to eighteen fifty two eighteen fifty two plus one plus eight plus five plus three or plus one plus eight plus two plus six and eighteen sixty nine appears once more but there is no need to go on with these quaint sums i have quoted enough to suggest the intricate and subtle patterns which the ingenious can discover everywhere in nature nature assuredly has provided us with coincidences so lavishly that we may well go about in amazement even the fiction of mr william le Q is not quite so abundant in strange coincidences as the life of the most ordinary man you could see reading a halfpenny newspaper it is only in literature indeed that coincidences seem unnatural sophocles has been blamed for making a tragedy out of a man who unwittingly slew his father and afterwards unwittingly married his mother it is incredible as fiction but i imagine real life could give us as startling a coincidence even as that each of us is to use sir thomas brown's phrase africa and its prodigies we tread a miraculous earth which is all mirrors and echoes hints and symbols and correspondences each deed we do may for all we know be echoed and mirrored in nature in a thousand places even before we do it and i can imagine it possible that the shape of a man's fate may be scattered over the palm of his hand i am a sceptic on the subject and i see what a door is open to charlatanry if we admit the presence of too many meanings in the world about us but i am not ready to deride the notion that there may be some undiscovered law underlying many of the coincidences which puzzle us true if some one contended that a mysterious sort of gravitation was working steadily through the years to bring those four soldiers together again at the birmingham dinner i should be anxious to hear his proofs but i am willing to listen patiently to almost any theory on the subject no theory could be more sensational than the facts end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the book of this and that this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the book of this and that by robert lind on indignation there is nothing in which the newspapers deal more generously than indignation there is enough indignation going to waste in the columns of the london press to overturn the pyramids and ruins and to alter the course of the danube we have had a characteristic flow of popular indignation over the execution of mr benton a british citizen in mexico probably not one englishman in a million had ever heard of mr benton before but no sooner was he executed and in his grave than he rose as it were the very impersonation of british citizenship outraged by foreigners on the whole there is nothing healthier than group indignation of the kind that sees in an injury to one an injury to all that demands just dealing for even the poorest and least distinguished member of the group it is the sort of passion it would be pleasant to see trained and developed my only complaint against it is that in the present state of the world it is too often reserved for foreigners and for those semi-foreigners the people who belong to a different political party or social class from your own one would have thought for instance that the group indignation which denounced the execution of mr benton without a fair trial might also have denounced the expulsion of the labor leaders from south africa with no trial at all 
the fact that it did not and that several of the london capitalist papers treated the whole south african episode as a good joke at the expense of labor is evidence that to a good many englishmen the maltreatment of british citizens is not in itself an objectionable thing provided it happens within the british empire it seems to me that this is an entirely topsy-turvy kind of patriotism for every british citizen who is likely to be badly treated abroad there must be thousands who are in danger of being badly treated in the british empire itself is not the killing of an english man by an english railway company for instance as outrageous a crime as the killing of an english man by a foreign general there is also this to be remembered your indignation against the criminal in your own country is more likely to bear fruit than your indignation against the criminal in a foreign country you can catch your english railway director with a single policeman you may not be able to catch your foreigner without an international war thus though i do not question the occasional value of indignation against wicked foreigners i contend that a true economy of indignation would lead to most of its being directed against wicked fellow-countrymen it may be retorted that englishmen certainly do not limit their indignation to foreigners and that the marconi campaign is a proof that a good englishman can always become righteously indignant against a bad englishman at least when the latter happens to be a welshman or a jew but the marconi campaign was only another example of group indignation against persons who were outside the group it was not in this instance a national or imperial group it was a party group what i am arguing for is the direction of group indignation not against outsiders but when necessary against the members of the group i should like to see conservatives becoming really indignant about conservative scandals liberals becoming really indignant about liberal scandals socialists becoming really indignant about socialist scandals as it is indignation is usually merely a form of sectarian excitement it is always easy to find something about which to become indignant in your political opponent if it is only his good temper his crime of crimes is that he is your political opponent you use his minor crimes merely as rods to punish him for that our indignation against our opponents to say truth is usually ready long before the happy excuse comes which loses it like a wild beast into the arena one sees a good example of this leashed indignation in the ulster unionist attitude to nationalist ireland there is a silly scuffle about flags at castle dawson between a sunday school excursion party and a hibernian procession both of which ought to have known better not a woman or child is injured according to the verdict of a judge on the bench but the ulster unionists armed to the teeth with indignation in advance denounce the affair as though it were on the same level of villainy with the september massacres not long afterwards real outrages break out in belfast and catholics and socialists are kicked and beaten within an inch of their lives here was a test of the reality of the indignation against outrages on human beings did the ulster men then come forward in a righteous fury against the wrongdoers on their own side not a bit of it sir edward carson did disown them in the house of commons but the ulster unionists as a whole raise not a breath of indignation being average human beings indeed they invariably retort to any charges made against them with an angry tu quoque to the south it is not long for instance since a special commission sat to investigate the facts about sweated women workers in belfast and issued a report in which the prevalence of sweating was demonstrated beyond the doubt of any but a blind man instead however of directing their indignation against the evils of a system in their own midst the ulster unionists at least one of their organs in the press straightway sent one of their representatives down into the south of ireland to prove how bad wages and conditions of life were there what a waste of indignation all this was munster was full of indignation against the disease of sweating in belfast 
which it could not cure ulster on the other hand was full of indignation against the disease of bad housing in dublin which it could not cure there is a flavour of hypocrisy in much of this anger against sins that are outside the circle of one's own responsibility i do not mind how many sins a man is angry with provided they include the sins he is addicted to himself and that are at his own door there is a little credit in a rich manufacturer's indignation against the evils of the land system if he is indifferent to the evils of the factory system and landlords who denounce industrial evils but see nothing that needs redressing in the lot of the agriculture or laborer are in the same boat perhaps in the end the world is served even by this outside virtue the landlords in order to distract attention from their own case have more than once brought a useful indignation to bear on the case of the manufacturers and vice versa and ultimately the bewildered ox-like public has begun to drink in a little of the truth on the other hand this is an unhealthy atmosphere for public virtue it gives rise to cynical views such as are expressed in the proverb when thieves fall out honest men come by their own and in the lines concerning those who compound for sins they are inclined to by damning those they have no mind to we all do it unfortunately the presbyterian speaks with horror of the way in which the catholic breaks the sabbath and the catholic thinks it a terrible thing that the presbyterian should go to a theatre on good friday montaigne who was by inclination a sensualist looked with disgust on the man who drank too much and the drunkard retorts that every vice except his own is selfish and antisocial even when we admit our own sins we are half in love with them it seems a less intolerable crime in oneself to rob the poor box than in one's neighbour to have an unwashed neck englishmen never began to sing the praises of cleanliness as the virtue that makes a nation great until they had themselves taken to the bath true they often washed as they governed themselves not directly but by proxy but even so cleanliness has been exalted into a national virtue till the very people of the slums where the bath is used only for the storage of coal have learned to shout dirty foreigner as the most indignant thing that can be said at a crisis there is nothing that makes us feel so good as the idea that some one else is an evil-doer our scandal about our neighbours is nearly all a muttered tribute to our own virtue it fills us with a new pride in ourselves that it was not we who gambled with trust money or made love to our neighbor's wife or ran away in battle by kicking our neighbors down for their sins we secure for ourselves it seems a better place on the ladder the object of all religion is to destroy this self-satisfied indignation with our neighbors to make us feel that we ourselves are no better than the prostitute or the foreigner similarly philosophy bids us know ourselves instead of following the line of least resistance and damning others that is why one would like to see englishmen concerned about injuries done to englishmen by englishmen even more than about injuries done to englishmen by foreigners indignation against the latter necessary though it may be is apt to become a mere melodramatic substitute for native virtue there are crimes enough at home for any englishman to practise his indignation upon without ever letting his eye wander further than dover crimes of underpayment crimes of overwork crimes of rotten houses crimes that are murder in everything but swiftness and theft in everything except illegality it is fine no doubt that englishmen should become hot with anger at the news of a benton murdered in mexico as it is fine that the democracies of europe should be inflamed with indignation at the murder of a ferrer in spain these things are evidence of large brotherhoods of an extension of those family charities which are at the back of all advance in civilization on the other hand can none of this passionate fraternity be spared for john smith age fourteen done to death by the half system or for his father killed on the line as the result of the need of making dividends for railway shareholders 
or for his mother working for a halfpenny an hour in a narrow room the filth of which is transmuted into gold for some rich man these too are your brothers and sisters and deserve the angry eloquence of an epitaph here is subject enough for indignation not a weak and an ineffectual indignation against foreigners but indignation knocking terribly at your own doors end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the book of this and that this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox org. recording by kathleen the book of this and that by robert lind the heart of mr galsworthy mr galsworthy has been writing to the times on the heartlessness of parliament the times always noted for its passion for humane causes ranges itself behind him and asserts that english men have now learned to speak of the politician with intellectual contempt as of one who is making a game of realities who fiddles a dull tune while rome is burning both mr galsworthy and the times are apparently agreed that the measures which parliament has for some time past been discussing are matters of trivial significance and in so far as they take up time which might be devoted to better things are an outrage upon the conscience of to use the odd phrase of the newspaper those who are most interested in the spectacle of life and the future of mankind mr galsworthy wearing his heart in his ink-pot not only denounces the indifference of politicians to vital things but goes on to lay down an alternative programme a programme of the heart as he might call it in contrast to the programme of the hustings he begins his list of things which ought to be legislated about with the sweating of women workers and insufficient feeding of children and he ends it with live instances of in an even odder phrase than that quoted from the times abhorrent things done daily daily left undone export of horses worn out in work for englishmen save the mark export that for a few pieces of blood money delivers up old and faithful servants to wretchedness mutilation of horses by docking so that they suffer offend the eye and are defenceless against the attacks of flies that would drive men so treated crazy caging of wild things especially wild songbirds by those who themselves think liberty the breath of life the jewel above price slaughter for food of millions of creatures every year by obsolete methods that none but the interested defend importation of the plumes of ruthlessly slain wild birds mothers with young in the nest to decorate our gentle women probably ninety-nine readers out of a hundred will sympathize with mr galworthy's bitter cry against a parliament that has so long left these and other wrongs unrighted let mr galsworthy take any one of his cases of inhumanity by itself and he is sure of the support of nearly all decent people in demanding that an end shall be put to it the human conscience has developed considerably in recent years in regard to the treatment both of human beings and of animals and though conscience is frequently dumb in the impressive presence of economic interests it has still the power to get things done as witness for example the establishment of minimum wage boards in certain sweated trades mr galsworthy however does not ask you to consider each of his desired reforms on its merits he asks you in effect to put them in place of the reforms which politicians are at present discussing almost any one of them he declares of his brood of evils is productive of more suffering to innocent and helpless creatures human or not and probably of more secret harm to our spiritual life more damage to human nature than for example the admission or rejection of tariff reform the disestablishment or preservation of the welsh church i would almost say than the granting or non-granting of home rule 
it seems to me that mr galsworthy is doing his cause or causes no service in making comparisons of this sort he is like a man who would go before parliament when it was discussing some big project like the nationalization of the railways and deny its right to legislate on such a matter till it had passed a measure forbidding the sticky sort of fly-papers one might sympathize heartily with his desire to abolish the slow torture of flies and i for one detest with my whole soul those filthy fly-traps in which the insects go dragging their legs out till they die but it is obvious that the question of cruelty to flies is one which must be dealt with on its own merits to weigh it in the balance against such a thing as nationalization of the railways is merely to invite a humorous rather than a serious treatment of the question it is not a comic question in itself it may easily become comic as a result of some ridiculous comparison that is more or less what one feels in regard to mr galworthy's implied comparison between the importance of free trade and the importance of putting an end to the export of horses worn out in work for english men save the mark export that for a few pieces of blood money delivers up old and faithful servants to wretchedness in so far as the export of horses leads to cruelty and wretchedness i agree with mr galsworthy that it ought to be stopped not because the horses are worn out in work for englishmen not because they are old and faithful servants that is mere sentimentalizing and rhetoric but because they are living creatures which ought not to be subjected to any pain that is not necessary on the other hand is not mr galsworthy rather unimaginative in failing to see that tariff reform might conceivably lead in present circumstances to intense pain and distress in every town and county in england the imposition or non-imposition of a tariff may seem at a superficial glance to belong to the mere pedantry of politics but consider the human consequences of such a thing every penny taken out of the pockets of the poor owing to an increase in the price of goods means the disappearance of a potential pennyworth of food from the poor man's home obviously in a country where hundreds of thousands of people are living on the edge of starvation and over it even a slight raise in the cost of things might produce the most calamitous results starvation and disease and the anguish of those who have to watch their children suffer an increase in crime and insanity and wretchedness these are all quite conceivable results of a sudden change in the poor man's capacity to buy the necessaries of life that is the humane free trader's case for free trade the humane tariff reformer's case for tariff reform on the other hand is that a change in the fiscal system would increase wages and employment and quickly put an end to the present abominations of starvation sweating and unemployment i am not concerned for the moment with the comparative merits of free trade and tariff reform i am concerned merely with pointing out that mr galsworthy's theory that such a thing as the export of worn-out horses causes more suffering to innocent and helpless creatures than would be caused by an error in fiscal policy affecting millions of men and women and children does not bear a moment's examination take again mr galworthy's comparison of the case of the home rule bill with the case of the caging of wild songbirds is not mr galsworthy in this instance also lacking in imagination had he read irish history he would have learned a little about the suffering to innocent and helpless creatures that logically flows from the denial of a country's right to self-government i will give the classic example in the late forties of the nineteenth century the irish potato crop failed the crops of corn were abundant cattle were abundant but the potatoes everywhere rotted in the fields under a mysterious blight as the potato was the staple food of the people this would have been sufficiently disastrous even in a self-governed country but if ireland had had self-government in eighteen forty seven 
does any one believe that her ministers would have allowed corn and cattle to go on being exported from the country while the people were starving right through the famine ireland went on exporting grain and cattle to the value of seventeen million pounds a year so that rents might be paid many leading irishmen urged the government to pass a temporary measure prohibiting the export of foodstuffs from ireland while the famine lasted this step had been taken by the governments of belgium and portugal in similar circumstances had it been taken in ireland as it is incredible that it would not if the union had not been in existence between half a million and a million men women and children would have been saved from the torture of death by starvation and typhus fever not only this but does not mr galsworthy also overlook those multiplied agonies of exile eviction and agrarian crime which living creatures in ireland would have been spared in great measure at least if the country had possessed self-government it may be doubted whether all the wild song-birds that have ever existed since the garden of eden have endured among them such an excess of misery as fell to the lot of the irish people in the half-century following the famine much of it preventable by a simple change in the machinery of the constitution nor can one easily measure the amount of suffering in england indirectly due to the fact that the political intellect of the country was so occupied with the irish question that it had not the time or the energy left to tackle scores of pressing english questions housing poor law reform half time these and a host of other matters have been thrust out of the way till statesmen released from the woes of ireland might have time to consider them many socialists have a way of forgetting the social meaning of constitutional changes they regard constitutional reform as something that delays social reform whereas it may be something that enables the public if it so desires to speed up social reform that is why home rule the abolition of the veto of the house of lords and a dozen comparable matters must be as eagerly ensued by socialists as by radicals the underfed child the sweated woman even the maltreated animal i imagine will benefit as a result of changes which to say the least take some of the impediments out of the way of the social reformer meanwhile let mr galsworthy and those who think with him redouble their efforts on behalf of humanity whether towards man or beast but let them not seek to destroy a good thing that is being done in order to call attention to a good thing that is not being done let them not try to persuade us that it is more important for the russian people to abolish mouse-traps than to get a constitutional monarch and sound parliamentary institutions i have the sincerest respect for mr galsworthy's heart for the generous passion with which he stands up for all the lame dogs in the world i agree heartily with every separate cause he advocates in his letter to the times it is only his table of values with which i quarrel and the destructive use he makes of it i believe that an overwhelming case could be made out against parliament on the score of its heartlessness but mr galsworthy has not made it End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of the book of this and that this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by d randall the book of this and that by robert lind spring fashions in spite of the progress of civilization there are still women to whom the returning spring is mainly a festival of dresses it is pleasant to know that there is after all a remnant of primitive humanity surviving women will before long be the only savages long after the last anthropologist has departed from the last south sea island in despair when the people have all become christians and have no manners and customs left the race of fashionable women will still march its feathered regiments 
up and down under the sun, a puzzle and an exasperation to the scientific inquirer. Like all really primitive people, women will go on refusing to believe in or bow down to the laws of nature. Nature may tell them, for instance, of the correct position of the human waist, but they will not listen to her. They will insist that the human waist may be anywhere you like between the neck and the knees, according to the fashion of the moment, and nature may as well put her fingers in her ears and go home. Savages, we are told, do not even believe in the manifest generalization of death. They regard each new death as an entirely surprising event, due not to natural but to accidental causes. Similarly, the fashionable woman regards the body each spring as an entirely new body, subject to none of the generalizations which seem appropriate to the body of even a year before. This is the grand proof she offers us of her superiority to the animals. She will have no commerce with the monotony of their ways. She will not submit herself to the regular gait of the sheep, the horse, or the cow which is the same this year as it was in the year of Wallaloo, or for that matter, in the year of Salamis. She claims for her body the liberty to move one year with the long stride of a running fowl, and the next at a hobble like a spansled goat. It might be said of her that she is not one animal, but all the animals. She will borrow from all nature, dead and alive. Indeed, as greedily as a poet. She will color her hair to look like a gorse bush and her lips to look like a sunset. She will capture the green from the grass, the purple from the hills, the blue from eastern seas, the silver from the mist, as it suits her fancy. One year she will demand of life that it shall be gorgeous in hue as a baboon's courtships the next, that it shall be as colorless as a rook's funeral. She enters upon the labor of life as though it were a long series of disguises. Probably it was her success in passing from form to form that led the ancient Greeks to suspect the presence of nymphs now in trees, now in running water, and now even in the hills. Everywhere in nature, Man sees evasive woman. There is nothing anywhere, from a mountain valley in flower to a chestnut tree glistening into bud, which does not remind him of something about her, her hats, her cloaks, or her ribbons. Such a plunderer of beauties would, one cannot but feel, become a great artist if only she possessed some standards. But she dresses without standards without philosophy. There is nothing but appetite in it all, and a capricious appetite at that. She has no settled principle but the principle of change. She flies from grace to ugliness lightheartedly, indiscriminately. She is like the kind of butterfly which you could get only in a fairy tale, a butterfly that could change itself into a mouse, and from a mouse into a dandelion, and from a dandelion into a camel, and from a camel into a grasshopper, and from a grasshopper into a cat, and so on through a thousand transformations. Her world leaves us giddy like the transformation seen in a pantomime. In her artistic ideals, she is a follower, not of Orpheus, but of Proteus. Yet, who can disparage her April ritual? She is in league with the whole singing earth, which once a year sets out on its long procession of praise. Her new fashions are but an item in the general rejoicing over the infinite resurrections of nature. Every thorn bush gowns itself in green, a ghost of beauty. Every laurel puts forth new leaves like little green flames. There is a glow in the grass as though some spirit lurked behind it deeper a million times than its roots. Everywhere, nature has relit the sacred fire. 
she has given us back warmth, the warmth in which food increases and birds sing. And we can no more escape her gladness than if we had been rescued from the perils and privations of a siege. This is the time when men wake up to find they are alive and their exultation makes them poets. One of the first things of which man seems to have become conscious in the world about him was the renewal of life each spring. The earth does like a snake renew, her winter weeds outmourn. Once a year he beheld the coming of the golden age again. He worshipped the serpent as the emblem of endless life long before he learned to suspect it as the devil. He may have been an infidel as he shivered in the winter rains, but the lark leaping into the sun awakened the old splendid credulity again. He knows that Persephone will rise. Hence the divine madness that possesses him year by year at this season, a madness which nowadays expresses itself largely in throwing hard balls at coconuts. Possibly this symbolizes the contemptuous mashing of the winter's fears. For is there anything which looks more like a withered fear than one of those grisly brown bearded fruits? And do not the showman's cries and his bell ringings at the coconut saloon make up a clamor like the clamor of the savage beating forth the flock of his superannuated terrors? He is the incarnation of the boastful faith that has returned to us. Perhaps, too, the coconuts may be symbols of the hoarded food supply of the winter, the supply which we were continually in dread might come to a slow close, and which we can now rail at and insult in our revived confidence in the green world. Certainly this enthusiasm of ours for the spring is not all so disinterested as it appears. We are hungry animals before we are poetical animals, and we are often praising the promise of our food when we seem to be most exalted in our raptures. It may be that even the pleasure we take in the singing of birds is simply a relic of the pleasure which primitive man felt as he heard the voice of many dinners making its way back to him at the turn of the year. But the appeal of music and color need not be so detailedly thematic as that. Man may not have loved the lark's song because he wanted in particular to eat the lark, or indeed any bird. He may have loved it merely as a significant voice amid the chorus and banners of the returning host of eatable things. If it were not so, many of our tastes would be different. Among the smells and colors of spring, those we love most are not the smells and colors of eatable things, but of inculinary things, like roses. And if we loved the music of birds by some standard of the stomach, it is the crowing of the cock and not the song of the lark that would inspire us to poetry. It is the grunting of the pig and not the cuckoo's call which would startle in us the thrill of romance. There is, on the other hand, just a chance that natural man does respond more sympathetically to the voice of the cock and the pig than to the speech of the cuckoo and the skylark. The difference between the farmer's and the artist's taste in landscape is proverbial. When man looks at the world and sums it up in terms of food, he is indifferent to masses of color and runs of music. His favorite color is the color of a good crop of corn or a field of grass that will fatten the cattle. He cares less for silver streams than for the drains in his turnip fields. Whether the love of the more ornamental things the useless songs of the birds and the scent of flowers, which is a prosaic thing only to the bees, is an advance on this passion for utility may be questioned by the advocates of the simple life. Ornament, they may contend, especially in woman's dress, is simply mannequin's vainglory. 
woman was first hung or robed with precious things, not in order that she might be happy, but in order that man might be able to boast of her among his neighbors. She was as sure a sign of his power as a string of enemies' heads hanging from his waist. She was the advertisement of his riches. Before long, woman became happy in her golden slavery. Wisely so, perhaps, for in the end, she was able to make use of the man's fastuous love of boasting to exact high terms for aiding him in his conspiracy of magnificence. She studied the science of surprise and applied it to the labor of dressing herself in such a way as to make him slavishly regard her as the most wonderful being on earth. If we may trust the testimony of Mrs. Edith Wharton's novels, woman has so subjugated man with this chameleon brilliance of hers in modern America that he thinks himself quite happy if she makes use of him as the hotman of her charms. Thus, in the spring fashions, we may see the triumph of a sex rather than a hymn of color to the revival of nature. It is a lamentable declension in theory, and therefore I do not entirely believe it. I still hold to the conviction that the gaiety of women's Easter dress is in some manner allied to the gaiety of the earth. It is but a decrepit gaiety compared to what it might be, but that is because of its long association with all sorts of alien things, the necessity of the manhunt, the pride of the church parade, and the rest of it. When woman meets man on equal terms, she will, one hopes in one's credulous moments, cultivate beauty more and fashion less. She will no longer be estranged from the morning stars that sing together and the little hills that clap their hands. Her feet will be beautiful in Bond Street, and Regent Street shall have cause to shout for joy. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Book of This and That This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen The Book of This and That by Robert Lind On Black Cats It is easy to imagine the enthusiasm of the audience at Manchester when a black cat walked onto the platform at a meeting of Sir Edward Carson's. Lord Derby, who presided, hailed it as an omen of the success of the Ulster cause. He went on to tell the audience that the last Unionist victory in Manchester had been presaged by the appearance of a black cat in some polling booth or other. That, you may be sure, was the most convincing argument in the night's speech-making. People who will stumble over the logic of politics for a lifetime can appreciate the logic of the black cat in a fraction of a second. Black cats, indeed, are one of the very few things in which a good many unbelievers nowadays believe. These are the substitute for the angels and devils of our grandfathers. We are skeptics in everything but our superstitions. The most superstitious people of all are often to be found among those who do not believe in God, and who would not dream of entering a church gate, unless there was no other way of avoiding walking under a ladder. These it is who pick up pins with the greatest enthusiasm, and who become downcast if a dog howls, and who had rather not sleep at all than sleep in a room numbered thirteen. They will deride the cherubim and the seraphim, but they will not risk offending the demon to whom they throw an oblation of the salt they have just spilt on the table. It is as though each man carried his own little firmament of immortals about with him, and sacrificed to them on his own infinitesimal altars. This is not, I suspect, because he loves them, but because he fears them. He regards them as a species of blackmailers, the Scottish way of looking at fairies. Nearly every portent is to him a portent of misfortune. The number thirteen, the spilling of salt, the bay of a dog, the sight of a red-haired man first thing on New Year's morning, dreams about babies. These things cast a gloom over his world deeper than midnight, and of this kind are nearly all the portents which wriggle like little snakes in the superstitious imagination. It is the distinction of the black cat that he has one of the few cheerful superstitions left to us. Why he should be so, no one can tell us, 
and he has not been considered so in all times or in all places. He has even been regarded on occasion as the false shape of a witch. Perhaps the origin of all our care of him was the tenderness of fear. He may be like the black god worshipped by the ancient Slavs, who were indifferent to his white brother god. They did this, we are told, because they thought that the white god was so good that they had nothing to fear from him in any case. But the black god one could not trust, and so one had to buy his good will. It seems not improbable that the veneration of the black cat may have begun in much the same way. The smile with which our ancestors first greeted him was, I fancy, a nervous, doubting smile, like the smile with which many of us try to cajole snarling dogs. Then, gradually, as he did not leap upon them and destroy them, they came to believe less and less in his will to do evil, and in the end he was canonized, and now he has been accepted as a sound English Tory, which is generally admitted to be the highest type of animal that nature has produced. Two centuries or so ago, Addison poured such finished contempt on all superstitions of this kind that it would have been difficult to believe that men and women of intellect would still be clinging to them today. At the same time, their survival is the most natural thing in the world. They are bound to survive in a world in which men live not in faiths and enjoyments, but in hopes and fears. Faith is the way of religion, and enjoyment is the way of philosophy. But hopes and fears are the colored lights that illumine the exciting way of superstition. If we are creatures of hopes and fears, we have no sun, and our lights have a trick of appearing and disappearing like will-o'-the-wisps, leading us a pretty dance whither we know not. Every step we take we expect to unfold the secret. We find omens in the direction of straws, in the running of hares, in the flight of birds. If the girl of hopes and fears wishes to know what color of a man she is going to marry, she waits till she hears the cuckoo in summer, and then examines the sole of her shoe in the expectation of finding a hair on it, which will be the color of her future husband's head. I will make a confession of my own. I have never listened slavishly for the cuckoo, but many years ago I had as foolish a superstition about farthings. I believed that they were luck-bringers. At the time I was lodging in the traditional garret in Pimlico, trying more or less vainly to make a living by writing. Whenever I had sent off a manuscript, I used to go out the same evening to a little shop where, when they sold a loaf, they always gave you a farthing change out of your threepence. How cheerily I used to leave the shop with the loaf under my arm and the farthing in my pocket. That farthing, I felt, could be trusted to cast a spell on the editor towards whom the manuscript was flying. It would be as effective as an introduction from one of the crowned heads of Europe, and even if, a night or two afterwards, the most loathsome of all visible objects, a returned manuscript, made the lodging-house look still more sordid than before, I abated no jot of my trust. My heart sank for the moment, but in the end I settled down to acceptance of the fact that there was a fool sitting in an editor's chair, who could resist even the power of farthings. On the next day, or the day after, I would set out with revived hope for the baker's shop again. I remember the acute misery I felt on one occasion when I went into a more pretentious shop, where the girl put my loaf in the scales and asked me whether I would prefer a small roll or a part of a loaf to make up the full threepence worth of weight. I would have given my boots, and even my old hat, to be able to say, Please, may I have my farthing? But my courage failed. There are things one cannot say to a pretty shop-girl. Years afterwards I happened to be discussing superstitions with a friend, and I instanced the well-known belief in the luckiness of farthings. But farthings aren't supposed to be lucky, said my friend with a smile of authority. They're supposed to be extremely unlucky. It was as though the world reeled. Here I had been steadily building up ruin for myself all that time with my miser's hoard of farthings. I felt like the man in the Silver King who cries, "'Turn back, O wheels of the universe, and give me back my yesterday. "'If only I could get back some of my yesterdays, "'I would assuredly buy my bread in that big, bright shop "'where the girl gives you full weight for your threepence, "'and never would I set foot in that little low shop "'where a half-blind old man wraps your loaf in a page of newspaper "'and lays in your hand a dirty farthing "'that is only the price of your undoing. "'It is perhaps natural that my experience "'should have left me rather unfriendly to superstitions.' I cannot believe that the universe, or even a single planet of it, is ruled by imps of chance which express themselves in the doings of crows, and in floating tea-leaves, and in the dropping of umbrellas. Better join the church of the sea-diacs of Borneo, if one can find nothing better to believe in than that. 
It is in order to protest against the heathen religion of crows and numbers and tea leaves that I sometimes deliberately leap onto a bus numbered thirteen, or walk under a ladder rather than go round it. Occasionally, I say, for my mood varies. There are days when I feel like turning a blind eye to bus number thirteen, and when a crow, sitting and cawing on the roof of the church opposite, gives me the shivers. It is in vain that I tell myself that the last superstition is the most irrational of all, because in some places the sight of one crow is supposed to be lucky, the sight of two unlucky, while in other places the reverse is the case, and apart from this the superstition does not refer to crows at all but to magpies. Then again, when I am arguing against the dislike of setting out on a Friday, I find myself compelled to admit that the holiday in which I was not able to get away till Saturday was, on the whole, the best I ever had. But the salt! I refuse to throw salt over my shoulder, no matter what happens. I prefer to exercise the demon with some formula from trigonometry, as I once heard a man doing when he passed under a ladder. And if I retain a hankering faith in black cats, it is, as I have said, the most cheerful superstition in the world. About two months ago, I was sitting one night in the depths of gloom, expecting news of a tragedy. Suddenly, I heard a cat mewing as if in difficulties. It seemed some way up the road, and I thought that it must be caught in a hedge, or that somebody was tormenting it. I went downstairs and put my hat on to go out and look for it, and had hardly opened the door when in walked a little black kitten with bright eyes and its tail in the air. I defy anyone to have disbelieved in black kittens at that moment. It seemed more like an omen than anything I have ever known. I had never seen the kitten before, and its owner has reclaimed it since. But I cannot help being grateful to it for anticipating with its gleaming eyes the happy news that reached me a day or two later. Of course, I do not believe the black cat superstition any more than I believe that it is unlucky to see the new moon for the first time through glass. But still, if you happen to be requiring a black cat at any time, I advise you to make quite sure that there are no white hairs in its coat. One white hair spoils all, and puts it on a level with any common squalor in the back garden. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of the Book of This and That. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annalisa Bodker. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind. Chapter 18 On Being Shocked Being shocked is evidently still one of the favorite pastimes of the British people. There has been something of a festival of it since the production of Mr. Shaw's new play. Even the open Bible, it appears, is not a greater danger to souls than Androcles and the Lion. Of course, the open Bible has become generally accepted in England now, but one remembers how the church used to censor it, and one looks back to the first men who protested against its being banned as to bright heroes of adventure. Everybody knows, however, that if the Bible were not already an accepted book, if we could read it with a fresh eye as a book written by real people like ourselves and only just published for the first time, it would leave most of us as profoundly shocked as Canon Hensley Henson, who, though he does not want to limit its circulation, is eager at least to expurgate it for the reading of simple persons. I do not, I may say, quarrel with Canon Henson. Every man has a right to be shocked, so long as it is his own shock and not a mere imitation of somebody else's. What one has no patience with is the case of those people who are always shocked in herds. They are intellectually too lazy to be shocked, so to say, off their own bat. So they join a mob of the shocked, as they might join a demonstration in the streets or a political party. They are so lacking in initiative that, instead of boldly being shocked themselves, they frequently even are content to be shocked by proxy. 
in the world of the theatre they hire the censor to be shocked for them by all the immoral plays that are written the censor having been duly shocked the public feels it has done all that can be expected of it in that direction and refuses to turn a hair afterwards no matter what it sees in the theatre it takes schoolgirls to musical comedies which are as often as not mere tinkling farces of lust but it does not care it has handed over its capacity for being shocked to the censor and nothing can stir it out of the happy sleep of its faculties any more nothing i should add except a shaw play for even the chalk of a dozen censors could not remove the offence of mr shaw he is like an evangelist who would suddenly rise up at a garden party and talk about god he is as bad form as one of those enthusiastic converts who corner us in railway trains or buttonhole us in the streets to ask us if we are saved he is a salvationist who has broken into the playhouse and as he unfolds the knockabout comedy of redemption we are aware that we no longer feel knowing and superior as we expect the winking laughter of the theatre to make us feel but ignorant and simple like a child singing its first hymns that is the mood at any rate of androcles and the lion that is the offence and the stone of stumbling mr shaw has stripped some of our most sacred feelings as bare as babies and we do not know what to do to express our sense of the indecency it is clear then that being shocked is simply a way of recovering our balance it is also a way of recovering our sense of superiority there is more pleasure in being shocked by the sin of one's neighbor or one's neighbor's wife than in eating cream buns not indeed that it is always the sins that shock us most much as we enjoy the whisper of how a great man beats his wife or a poet drinks or some merry greek has flirted her virtue away we would shake our heads over them with equal gravity if they had the virtues of buddhist monks and sisters it is the virtues that shock us no less than the vices perhaps it was because swinburne gave utterance to the horror a great many quite normal people feel for virtue that in spite of an intellect of far from splendid quality he ended his life as something of a prophet tolstoy never shocked europe more than a hair's weight so long as he blundered through the seven sins like nearly any other man of his class he only scandalized us when he began to try to live in literal obedience to the sermon on the mount when we are in church no doubt we say fie to the young man who had great possessions and would not sell all that he had and give to the poor as jesus commanded him but in real life we should be troubled only if the young man took such a command seriously obviously then the psychology of being shocked cannot be explained in terms of triumphant virtue we must look for an explanation rather in a widespread instinct which forbids a man to be different either in virtues or in vices from other people it arises out of a loyalty to ordinary standards which the average man has made for his comfort perhaps we should say for his self-respect to deny these standards in one's life is like denying a foot rule which would be an outrage on the common sense of the whole trade union of carpenters or one might put it this way to live publicly like a saint is as disturbing as if you were to ask a tailor to measure your soul instead of your legs it is to whisk your neighbor into a world of new dimensions to leave him dangling where he can scarcely breathe this does not it may be thought explain the attitude of the shocked man towards sinners but after all we are very tolerant of sinners until they break some code of our class john bright defended adulteration because he was a manufacturer 
grocers object to the forgery of checks which is a danger to the business in a manner in which they do not object to the forgery of jam which puts money in their purses we are more shocked by the man who gets drunk furiously once in six months than by the man who tipples all the time not because the former is more surely destroying himself but because he is more likely to do something that will inconvenience business or society we can forgive almost all sins except those that inconvenience us there are others it may be argued that we hate for their own sake but is not a part of our hatred even of these due to the fact that they inconvenience our minds having about them something novel or immeasurable it is in the last analysis that breaches of codes and conventions shock us most if your uncle danced down piccadilly dressed like a chinaman your sense of propriety would be more outraged than if he appeared in the divorce court since bad as the latter is it is less bewilderingly abnormal mr wells in the passionate friends offers a defense of the conventions by which society attempts to reduce us all to a common pattern he sees in them as it were angels with flaming swords against the remorseless individualism that flesh is heir to they are a sort of compulsion to brotherhood they are signs to us that we must not live merely to ourselves but that we must in some way identify ourselves with the larger self of human society it is a tempting paradox and in so far as it is true it is a defence of all the orthodoxies that have ever existed every orthodoxy is a little brotherhood of men at least it is so until it becomes a little brotherhood of parrots it only breaks down when some horribly original person discovers the old truth that it is a shocking thing for men to be turned into parrots and gives up his life to the work of rescuing us from our unnatural cages perhaps a brotherhood of parrots is better than no brotherhood at all but the worst of it is the conventions do not gather us into one brood even of this kind they sort us into a thousand different painted and chattering groups each screaming against the other like in vulgar phrase the devil no brotherhood does not lie that way perched vainly in his cage of malice and uncharitableness man feels more like a boss than a brother there is nothing so like an average superman as a parrot the passion for being shocked then must be redeemed from its present cheapness if it is to help us on the way to being fit for the double life of the individual and society we must learn to be shocked by the normal things by the conventions themselves rather than by breaches of the conventions those who lift their hands in pious horror over conventional christianity should also lift their hands in pious horror over conventional unchristianity the conventions are often merely truths that have got the sleeping sickness but by this very fact they are disabled as regards to any useful purpose every great leader whether in religion or in the reform of society comes to us with living truths to take the place of conventions he gives the lie to our bread and butter existence and teaches us to be shocked by most things to which we are accustomed and many things which we have treasured society progresses only in so far as it learns to be shocked not by other people but by itself what did england ever gain except a purr or a glow from being shocked by french morals or german manners the english taste for being shocked is only worth its weight in old iron when it is directed on some things such as the procession of the poor and the ill-clad that circulates from morning till night in the streets of english slums 
being shocked is a maker of revolutions and literatures when men are shocked by the right things or rather by the wrong things out of a mood of shock came blake's fiery rout of proverbs in that poem which begins a robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage it is unfortunately not the robin redbreast in a cage that shocks us most now it is rather the robin redbreast which revolts against being expected to sit behind bars and sing like a mechanical toy our resurrection as men and women will begin when we learn to be shocked by our mechanical servitudes as ruskin and morris used to be in their fantastic way instead of being shocked as we are at present the conventionally good the conventionally bad and the conventionally artistic who are too pallid to be either by what are really only our immortal souls at our present stage of evolution heaven would shock us far more than earth has succeeded in doing that is at once our condemnation and our comedy End of chapter eighteen on being shocked recording by annalisa bodker chapter nineteen of the book of this and that this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tom daly the book of this and that by robert lind confessions father hugh benson has been praised for his courage in confessing that he could not read sir walter scott surely this must be a world of lies if it is remarkable to find a man honest in so simple a matter as his tastes in literature all but one or it may even be a few hundred we are under the empire of shame which withers truth upon our lips and threatens us with the rack if we do not confess things that are lies that is the reason why in any given year we all appear to have the same tastes this year it is croce last year it was bergson the year before that it was william james the year before that it was nietzsche in advanced circles you can already say what you like about bergson you will hardly dare to be frank about croce till after midsummer it is the same in literature as in philosophy twenty years ago we were all swearing that stevenson and kipling were two such artists as england had never seen before we did not say they were greater than dickens and shakespeare we simply accepted them as incomparable today no one who is not middle-aged speaks of mr kipling as an artist and one is humoured as a fogey by boys and girls if one mentions stevenson seriously in a discussion on literature nor can we blame this popular changeableness as entirely dishonest we may love an author for his novelty for a time as we loved swinburne for his novel meters and mr kipling for his novel brutalities and after a while when the novelty has faded we may see that there is little enough left too little at any rate to justify our primrose praises. It is an ignominious confession to make that we have been taken in by a new kind of powder and paint, but, as everybody else has been taken in and afterwards disillusioned in the same way and in the same hour, that does not trouble us. We do not mind being ignominious in regiments. It is the refusal to write about face and to march at the public word of command that would be the difficult thing. We had rather go wrong with the crowd than be solitary and conspicuous in our rectitude. In the Sunday school we used to sing, Dare to be a Daniel, but we sang it with a thousand voices. The lion's den was an acclaimed resort for the childish imagination at the moment. In one's surroundings, as a matter of fact, one could have achieved resemblance to Daniel only by some such extreme step as casting doubt upon his historical existence. Had one done so, the committee of the school would quickly have made it clear 
that Daniel in short breeches and a white Sunday tie was a most undesirable person. It has always been as great a crime to behave like Daniel as it has been an act of piety to praise him. It is because there are so few who are willing to face the terrors of isolation that anyone who will do so gains an easy notoriety. A man has only to confess quite honestly that he has individual tastes and failings in order to take a place among men of genius. His confession, however, must be as honest as if vanity and pretense had never been known. It is not enough that he should confess his vices. It may be more fashionable at the time to confess one's vices than one's virtues. When a confession is merely a form of boasting, it becomes as frivolous as Dr. Cook's story of his discovery of the pole. There is a natural humility in the great books of confessions. The writers of sham confessions are no more capable of the act of bending than a balloon. It is possible to give the life story of every sin one has ever committed and yet to remain dishonest. One may be attitudinizing even while one tells the truth. It is, it may be granted, extraordinarily difficult to see oneself truly and without bias, and to refrain from discovering excuses for oneself faster almost than one discovers one's faults. It is this humbug sense of excuses in the background that makes most of us the merest pretenders when we confess that we are blackguards and call ourselves by other insulting names. Our confessions are, as often as not, mean attempts to forestall the accusations of those we have injured. We make them in the hope of turning anger into pity, and when the trick has succeeded we laugh in secret triumph over the simplicity of human nature. Anatole Franz has maintained that all the good writers of confessions from Augustine onward are men who are still a little in love with their sins. It is a paradox with the usual grain of truth. The self-analyst, probably enough, will fall in love with the material on which he works just as the surgeon does. One has heard surgeons wax enthusiastic over some unique case of disease which they have cured. They will even speak of such things as lovely. It is thus a fighter shakes hands with his opponent. Similarly, the saint with his sins. For him they will always be illuminated, as it were, by grace. Saints have even been known to thank God for their sins as the means of their salvation. On the other hand, no good book of confessions is mere play-acting, lip service to heaven's secret gratitude to the devil, when confession becomes a luxury of this dramatic sort, one may begin to suspect oneself as but a refined sort of sensualist. There are moods of false exaltation, in which the confession that one has broken a commandment seems to add an inch to one's stature. The true confessor, on the other hand, will as soon confess a mouse as a mountain. He will not begin like Baudelaire in the café, "'On the night I killed my father,' He will more likely tell us, like Pepys, how he beat the servant girl with a broom, or how, like Horace, he threw away his shield and ran from the battle. Pepys lives in literature because he was unblushingly, unboastingly frank about his littleness, his jealousy of his wife, his petty conquests of other women, his eternal sensualities mixed with his eternal prayers. How vitally he portrays himself in a thousand sentences like I took occasion to be angry with my wife before I rose about her putting up half a crown of mine in a paper box which she had forgotten where she had lain it. But we were friends again as we are always. Between that and the artistic attitude of naughtiness in a book like Mr. George Moore's Memoirs of My Dead Life, what a gulf there is! The one is as fresh a piece of nature as a thorn-tree on a hillside. The other is as near life as the cloak and dagger plays of the theatre. English prose literature has suffered immensely during the last century because it has shrunk from the honesty of Mr. Pepys and attitudinized, now in the manner of Prince Albert, now in the manner of Mr. Moore. It has worn the white flower of a blameless life, or the opposite, instead of the white sheet of repentance. It has suffered from the obsession at one time of sex, at another time of sexlessness. 
It has seldom, like modern Russian literature, been the confession of a man's or a people's soul. It is not only in literature, however, that the supreme genius is a genius of confession. One demands the same kind of honest and personal speech from one's friends. One cannot be friends with a man who is not a man but an echo. The poets have sung of echo as a beautiful thing. It may be well enough among the mountains, but who would live in a world of echoes? One demands of one's friends that he shall be himself, even though it involves a liking for the poems of Mr. G. R. Sims, rather than that he should be a boneless imitation who can talk the current jargon about Picasso and the Cubists. To confess that one has no taste for the latest fad in the arts and philosophy is becoming a rarer and rarer form of originality. We utter our pallid judgments in terror at once of the click of the moment and of posterity. We are afraid that our contemporaries may tell us that we no longer can keep abreast of Lejeune, but are becoming ossified. We are afraid that our grandchildren will look back on us with the same smiling superiority with which we look back on those who raved against Wagner and flung epithets at Ibsen. Be in no trouble about that. Your grandchildren will smile at you in any case. Has not the reputation of Matthew Arnold already sunk lower than that of the reviewers in the daily papers? Is not even Pater being thrust into a second grave as an indolent driveller without judgment? There is no phylactery against the poor opinion of one's grandchildren, nor need we be greatly in fear of damning bad art because an occasional Wagner has been condemned. After all, there were other people condemned besides Wagner. They were so bad, however, that we had forgotten what the critics said about them. Pope wrote his Dunciad, not against the Wagners and the Ibsens of his day, but against all those fashionable fellows whose names survive only in his satire. No one would have the courage to write a Dunciad today. We have discovered that there are no dunces except the people who were the vogue yesterday. Thus we chorus the season's reputations. We are ready to stab last week's gods in the back if it happens to be the fashion. We can all say what we please about Shakespeare now that it no longer requires courage to do so, but we dare not confess with equal frankness our feelings about some little wren of a minor poet who came out of the shell a month ago. The world has become a maze of echoes in which no honest conversation can be heard for the dull reverberant speech of the walls. End of chapter 19